It turns out that when a bomb disposal expert approaches a device designed to kill them, their heart rate actually goes down. So who better to give practical advice on remaining calm under pressure? Well, hello there. Firstly, if this is your second or third time you've seen me and you're not subscribed, that's the universe telling you you need to subscribe. That's the formalities done. Let's talk about staying calm under pressure. And here are three lessons from the US Navy's top bomb disposal experts. Now, these guys and gals will dispose of any type of bomb you care to present them with. Biological, <coughs> chemical, even nuclear. They'll also disarm a torpedo whilst underwater if the need arises. So what would they teach us? Don't follow Alice down the rabbit hole. Something's going wrong. You start to panic and your mind races. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if? What if? What if? This is what bomb disposal experts refer to as falling down the rabbit hole. Only, unlike Alice, Wonderland is not on the other side. The types of IEDs, improvised explosive devices, bomb disposal experts encounter, and the different ways these have been ingeniously and insidiously designed are infinite. Does it have this type of circuitry or that type of switch? Or maybe it's a new type of circuit board they haven't encountered yet. To avoid tumbling down the rabbit hole, they do what's called a threat assessment. This means looking objectively at the situation and asking, what type of problem is this? To do this, they think of a similar experience they've been in before and try to remember what worked in that situation. So maybe they haven't been in exactly the same situation. No problem. They simply generalize. They probably dealt with something kind of similar, or maybe they've seen someone else deal with a similar situation. This leveraging of experience is what helps these experts stay calm. Using your prior experience or the experience of others will help you get your head around a scary situation one where panic could potentially set in and cause you to lose your grip. You'll probably still be scared, but you'll be able to stay calm and carry on. Look on the bright side and focus on what you can control. There's a story which does the rounds in the bomb disposal unit of the US Navy about a chief who's trying to defuse a mine whilst underwater. Suddenly, he became trapped, unable to move his hands or feet. The story goes that the next thing to go through the chief's mind was, okay, I'm still breathing, that's good. Now, what else do I have going for me? Steve Southwick and Dennis Cleary have spent 20 years studying resilient people who experienced traumatic situations. The people they studied were prisoners during the Vietnam War, or civilians who've dealt with medical problems, abuse, and trauma. The one thing all these survivors had going for them was rational optimism. In 1965, during the Vietnam War, an American pilot called James Stockdale was shot down over enemy lines. Having ejected and landed safely, he was captured by the Vietnamese and placed in a prison known as the Hanoi Hilton for the next seven and a half years. The Vietnamese soon realised that Stockdale was the most senior officer they'd captured, so they tortured him routinely and withheld medical attention for his injuries. At one point, the people holding him captive told him he was going to be paraded in public and used as propaganda. So, to make sure he couldn't be used for their benefit, Stockdale slit his own scalp and disfigured himself. When they covered his wounds with a hat, he beat himself, so his face was so swollen he was unrecognisable. And so I found a stool that was heavy, heavier than any of these chairs, so I just started bashing my face, my cheekbones with that stool. And when they came back in again, there was uh, no, uh, no, no question about it. My, 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 my eyes were swollen shut. Stockdale put in place a code of conduct that other prisoners held in the face of their plight. His actions in the prison were so effective in leading group resistance against their captors, the Vietnamese decided to move him to solitary confinement. During this time, he was kept in a windowless, three-foot by nine-foot cell with the light kept on around the clock. Now, despite having no reason to think he might make it out alive, Stockdale survived and eventually returned home to his family. Many of his fellow prisoners weren't so lucky. Stockdale said the reason for his survival was his ability to embrace the harshness of his situation with a healthy optimism. He said, You mustn't confuse a faith that you'll prevail in the end, which you must never lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal fact of your current reality, whatever they may be. It's a paradox of hoping for the best whilst acknowledging and preparing for the worst. The Stockdale paradox was outlined as one of the keys to success in a book called Good to Great, about why some organisations excel, where others stay middle of the road. When interviewing Stockdale for the book, author Jim Collins had this dialogue. So, who couldn't make it out? Collins asked. Oh, that's easy, Stockdale replied. The optimists. The optimists? Collins questioned, confused. Yes, the optimists, said Stockdale. Those are the ones who said they'll be out by Christmas. Then Christmas would come and Christmas would go. Then they said they'd be out by Easter and Easter would come and Easter would go. And then Thanksgiving and then it would be Christmas again. They died of a broken heart. Going back to the story about the Navy chief, 
by focusing on the good while being realistic about the situation, he was able to remain calm, focus on the thing he was able to control, and take steps towards resolving the situation. If you can do one little thing to make it a bit better, then do that. If you can do another thing after that, and another thing, you have a cascade of positivity instead of spiraling negativity. Ask, is this an emergency? It's only a true emergency if I can't find a solution. What's my next step to make this situation just slightly better? Things won't phase you, even life and death situations, if you're rationally optimistic and feel like you have control over what you do in response. Know your next step to take, but it's okay if you don't. Knowing the next step to take is the secret to staying calm and focused when faced with a great unknown. We're all scared of being confronted with the unknown. Not knowing leaves gaps our brain wants to fill, so it fills them with worry and speculation about what might or might not happen. This is tumbling down a rabbit hole. The secret of remaining calm and focused in the face of the unknown is simply deciding on the next step to take. As the bomb disposal experts say, if you were sitting there and had no idea what to do, that would be really terrifying. When you have the next step in mind, that's what you focus on. Even if your next step is just a small baby one, it doesn't matter. Maybe your next step is to ask for help because you're massively out of your depth. No problem, just make sure the next step is technical and specific and you'll be able to resist panic. Focusing on the process and not the outcome is a 2000 year old idea. It's what the ancient Stoics, such as Epictetus, Seneca and Marcus Aurelius used to avoid negative emotions. And if a technology can survive that long, you can be sure that it works. So focus on the next step and then the next and then the one after that. But what if you don't know your next step? You've got panic rising, your heart is pounding and you don't know what to do. Here's where neuroscience and another ancient technology, Buddhism, converge. Consider the thoughts going through your mind. Ask one simple question, are they helpful? Make a decision whether they are or not. Joseph Goldstein, a leading mindfulness expert, has said, this thought which has arisen, is it helpful? Is it serving me or others in the same way or is it not? Is it just playing out perhaps old conditions of fear or judgment or things that are not very helpful for ourselves and others? It's the same for our bomb disposal experts. When panic sets in for them and they fear literally for their life, they've been taught to think, none of this is helpful, what do I do now? They get back into thinking about the process and all of a sudden they're back into rational thought and away from any kind of selfish fear. In his book, The Upward Spiral, Alex Korb tells us that research has shown making decisions as well as helping solve problems reduces worry and anxiety. He writes, making decisions includes creating intentions and setting goals. All these are part of the same neural circuitry and engage the prefrontal cortex in a positive way, reducing worry and anxiety. Making decisions also helps overcome striatum activity, which usually pulls you towards negative impulses and routines. Making decisions changes your perception of the world, finding solutions to your problems and calming the limbic system. If you enjoy these types of rules for life and want to find out what I've learned about one rule which rules them all, then you can click this video here. Actually, it's not as dramatic as it might sound. As it turns out, if we look upstream in our systems and processes, we can find and make one decision that will make a hundred or a thousand other decisions redundant. I've used this to great effect in the rowing coaching I sometimes do, and I explain more about how that works in the video. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.